My precious Savior suffered pain and agony. He bore it all, he bore it all that I might live. I with him might live. He broke the bonds of sin and set the captive free. He bore it all, all that, that I, I might, might live. In his presence live. He bore it Jesus all. Jesus bore it all. I might see his shining, see his shining face. He bore it Freely all. bore it all. That I might live. I with him might live. I stood condemned, stood condemned to, to die, die, but Jesus truly took my place. place. He bore it all, all that, that I might live. in his presence live. They placed a crown of thorns upon my Savior's head. He bore it Freely all, bore it all that I might, live. I with him might live. By cruel men with spear, his side was pierced and bled. He bore it all, all that, that I, I might. might live. In his presence live, he bore it Jesus all. Jesus bore it all. I might see his shining, see his shining face. He bore it all. Freely bore it all. That I might live. I with him might live. I stood condemned, stood condemned to, to die. But Jesus freely took my place. He bore it all. all that, that I might, might live. In his presence live. Up Calvary's hill in shame, the blessed Savior trod. He bore it freely all. Freely bore it all. I with him might live between two thieves they crucified the Son of God He bore it all, all that, that I, I might, might live. in his presence live He bore it Jesus all bore that it all. I might see his shining, see his shining face. face He bore it Freely all bore it all that I might live. I with him might live I stood condemned, stood condemned to, to die, die But Jesus freely took my place. place He bore it all, all that, that I might, might live. in his presence live the message will center is there at verse 23. Paul says, What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim unto you. That's the, that's the heart of the passage. That is the key text in this particular section. When Paul says to the men of Athens, The one whom you worship as the unknown God, that is that he is the one whom I proclaim unto you. Now we've got to get to this text by way of the context. You remember that Michael dealt last week with the conversion of the jailer at Philippi, one of the climactic moments in Paul's second missionary journey. Now when we come to Athens, we've come to the next great event on that journey. Of course, uh, there was quite a lot of things happened before Paul ever got to Athens. We're not going to deal with them in detail. But he began to travel west. He left uh, Philippi and he went to uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, or rather I ought to say he passed through these two cities. Why didn't he preach there? Well, I suppose that Paul was selective. Uh, Amphipolis was just a military station. Apollonius was a little place dedicated to the god Apollo. There were no Jewish synagogues there, and therefore no points of contact for the apostle. And consequently, since Paul never wasted his time, or wasted his energy, he moved on past these cities. The first city was about uh, 33 miles away. The next city was another 37 miles farther on, and about 100 miles away from Philippi, traveling along that main Roman thoroughfare, he finally came to the city of Thessalonica. Now there, he preached the gospel, there was opposition from the Jews, and on the cover of night, the brethren led him out of the city, down the road south, to a little place called Berea. It's quite evident that Berea was off the beaten track. Berea was not a main city, and Paul went to Berea to rest, it seems to me. Uh, he'd had a very rough time so far. He needed breathing space, and so the brethren took him where they thought the Jews would not find him. But as always happened, Paul could not rest, he could not be quiet. He began to preach the gospel, and we're told there, in those remarkable words, that the men of Berea were more noble than the people of Thessalonica, because they daily searched the scriptures to see whether these things were so. That's a fascinating thing to me. You know, uh, sometimes I think that the Bereans may well have had an advantage living off the main highway. There's a certain conceit that we get into our minds. We have the idea that people who live in cities, uh, uh, well, uh, they're, they're a bit smarter than the people who live out in the country. 
You, you know how people feel about the great city folk. We think that all the intelligence and all the intellectuals are in the city. And sometimes, I think preachers feel this way too, sometimes they imagine it's going to be harder to preach in a great city than in a small village or a small town. Sometimes we imagine, for example, it will be harder to preach in a place like London. People are going to be more demanding in a place like London. All the clever cosmopolitan people are in London. And way in these little villages off the main highway, well, you have the country bumpkins, the yokels, and they don't know very much about anything. That's how we feel about it sometimes, but it's not the case, you know. You know that it's historically been true that in the villages, in the little mountain valleys, in the, in the glens and the forests, eh, those are the places where the preacher has often been made to work the hardest because those people off the beaten track have been the people who had their Bibles in their hands. And when the preacher stood up and preached, they haven't simply swallowed everything he said, but they've said to him, now come on, show me where it is in the Word of God. Is this man preaching the truth? Is this really what the Word of God is teaching? You often find it's people in the out-of-the-way places that are the ones who really examine the scriptures and, t and demand to know that what is being said is true. Now that's the true nobility. It's not that uh, the people of Berea were more noble because of their ancestry, or because of their education, because of their birth, because of their wealth. There was a kind of spiritual nobility about the Bereans. They said, is this the truth? And they daily searched the scriptures to see whether these things were so. Now you can guarantee that Paul was happy in Berea. Because any preacher's happy to meet people like that. We don't want people like Starling. Have you seen a young Starling? It's all mouth. You ever see those young Starlings hopping about on your, on your, your lawn? They're, they're just one great big yellow peak. And they sit there waiting for their mothers to stuff them full of whatever happens to be around. And it goes down in one gulp. You've seen it, I can tell by your face this. But there are people like that. But we don't want people like that. We don't want people who blindly believe everything the preacher says. Every, swallow everything given to them. We don't want people who want pre-digested religion. We want people who are willing to use their God-given faculties to examine the truth, to see that it really is the truth. And thank God there are no closed doors in the Lord's church. Every door is open. The, 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 the key is in every door. And you can go right in and examine. We don't need stained glass windows either to darken the interior. Because there's no darkness where the truth is concerned. The entrance of thy word giveth light, uh, the scriptures say. So then, at Berea Paul was happy, but it didn't last for very long because those terrible Jews in Thessalonica discovered that he left them by night and they made their way down to Berea and again there was persecution. And so the brethren decided to take Paul on his way to Athens. There's a remarkable thing here. The journey from Berea to Athens was all of 200 miles. And yet the love of those people for Paul was such that they went with him all the way. Evidently he left Silas and Timothy back there, carrying on the work in Berea, whilst brethren, his new converts, let us say, took him all the way down to Athens. Actually, if you read the, read the passage, it almost seems as if they carried out a little ploy uh, designed to make the Jews think that they were heading for the shore uh, and that Paul was going to leave by boat, but he didn't do that. He made the way on foot, no doubt, all the way down to Athens. And then these beloved brethren turned around and they went back to Athens again. And I remember having an experience that, that always springs to mind when I read this. I was in, I think it was Abilene, Texas, many years ago, and I needed to go to Cleburne. I discovered there was no train. Trains don't run over there, you know. Uh, and, and there was no plane service from Abilene down to Cleburne for this appointment. And there was no bus service available at the time. And so one brother said, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll take you down. And so we jumped into his car, he drove me 200 miles, he had a cup of coffee and drove 200 miles back. Now that's fellowship. That's when you know that people love you. That's when you know that they have a good opinion of you and they want to help you in that way. And, and the opinion of the brethren of Berea, of this man Paul, was revealed in that they took him all of 200 miles and then made their tedious way back again, leaving Paul in Athens to await the arrival of these two young friends of his, Paul, uh, Timothy and Silas. Now, it says it there, doesn't it, at the beginning of that passage. It says... Uh, uh, where are we? Let me get the verse I'm looking for. Not the beginning of the passage. Verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, 
Two words there that really don't go very well together when you think about it. Paul waiting. Can you imagine a man like Paul waiting for anything? I don't, of course, he was supposed to be there resting. He was supposed to be there in safety. But you can't imagine Paul taking it easy. After all, there's an enemy to be defeated. There are souls to be won. There's a gospel to be preached. And so whenever Paul went to Athens, instead of waiting peacefully, he waited, but he used his time to the best advantage. I can see that man walking along the streets of that city. And I'll tell you something, this was the very first time he'd ever been to Athens. And believe me, it must have been a revelation to him. Here is a man, a Jew, steeped in Judaism, brought up in all the traditions of the fathers, uh, knows all of the law, and he comes to Athens, uh, the mistress of the cultural world of the time, you might describe her. And obviously, it must have been a revelation to this Jew to be in Athens. Why, I've never been to Athens, I'd like to go. Because I can imagine there must be a lot of things that would fascinate me in Athens. Things I would simply love to see. I've heard so much about Athens. You must have heard about the Athenian culture, about the art architecture, about the sculpture, about the art of that great city. You must have heard about the learning of Athens. Well, it was certainly famous in the days of Paul. And here's a man coming from that narrow little country, Palestine, and he's coming to the heart of the civilized world, the mistress of the world. Don't you think it must have been a revelation to him as he walked up and down those streets and he saw buildings the like of which he'd never seen before and artwork the like of which his eyes had never befallen? A, a true revelation. What's he thinking about as he goes to Athens? What does he see? Well, his spirit is provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. What a way of describing Athens when you think about it, isn't it? You say, Paul, hey, you went to Athens. Did you see the uh, Mars Hill bill, I'm going to say? Because, you know, evidently the authorized version started off with the Areopagus, but then when they got to verse 20, they got a bit of sense. They translated it Mars Hill. It's a lot easier. Hey, Paul, did you see Mars Hill? Did you see the temple to Jupiter? What did you think? See the marvelous columns that they have there? The marvelous buildings? What did you think of Athens, Paul? Full of idols. That's cutting it down to size, isn't it? You know, it's not the impression the tourist gets today. If you want a package tour to Greece and you land up in Athens, what do you do when you come back? Oh, what do you do? Oh, we saw such and such a thing. We, we saw, you never think, you never hear a tourist saying it was full of idols. Well, that's Paul's impression. Very different from the tourists of today and the tourists of his own time. Because, you know, about 50 years after Paul went to Athens, and, and this is a well-known fact in classical history, another man called Pausanias, went, to, went to, to Greece. He was a Roman. He went to Greece and he wrote six volumes, six volumes describing the beauty of Greece. And he spent more time in Athens than in any city on the whole of his tour. And he goes into the, the most detailed description of the architecture and the temples. He talks about the gods. He talks about the altars that were made. He talks about them being made of gold and marble and silver and wood and stone. He's really fascinated with Athens and the beauty, with the art, the culture, the learning. The Apostle Paul comes. He's just full of idols. It's no wonder that Ernst Renan, the French skeptic, uh, spoke of Paul as that ugly little Jew. He calls him the ugly little Jew who abused Greek art by calling its statues idols. That's exactly what they were. They were idols. As a matter of fact, it's said, uh, it was easier to find a man than to find a god in Athens. That simply meant there were so many gods there, it was easier to find a god that we're looking for than to find a man. And there were these, these altars and idols all over the place. There was an idol to just about everything that they could think of. They didn't only personify the graces and the virtues, but they also personified human passion, greed and avarice and lust and violence and anger and hatred. Everything that could be personified and turned into a god, you can guarantee that the Greeks did it. And there in Athens, that's what, what, that, that's what the apostle saw. So he ignored its history, its art, its sculpture, its architecture. He ignored its scholarship. Well, it was the center of philosophy. That's where people went to study. 
The passage tells us that he came into contact with certain of the Stoics and the Epicureans, or Epicureans, depending on how you want to pronounce that one too. But you know, when he comes to talk to these men, he doesn't deal with them on a philosophical basis. He only makes one quotation from philosophy, and he quotes from one of their lesser known poets, Aratus, and that's it. He doesn't bow down to their philosophy. He's indifferent to all of the things that fascinate other travelers. And he says it's full of idols. Oh, why was he so angry? Why was he so incensed? Because that's the word. You read the the verse there. That his spirit was provoked with him. Have I come across that word before? I'll tell you, you, you've already seen it. You've already seen it in chapter 15 and verse 39. Do you remember those two men who had an argument? Paul and Barnabas? Do you remember the word that was used there? Paroxysm? It's the same word. Paul had a fit. That's what it it means. He he was really incensed. His spirit was disturbed. He was angry. He was incensed. He was outside of himself when he saw the city given over to idolatry. Now, think why. I've already told you that he was a Jew. Why? There There was no place for idols in his philosophy, in his thinking. His religion was all down the line against idolatry. He had been brought up with the law that said, Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. And consequently, as a Jew, Paul was violently opposed against everything. He had a passionate hatred of anything that resembled an idol and consequently a god. And that's exactly why everything that other men praised in Athens, Paul found to be nauseating. And because he found it nauseating, he began right there uh, to talk about it. I know that it says, uh, so he argued in the synagogue. And by the way, that shows there mustn't have been too many Jews there. The synagogue not a synagogue, not many synagogues, just enough Jews to to, to warrant one synagogue in Athens. He argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. How would you put that in other words? It simply means that he went to the marketplace and he talked to anybody who'd listen to him. He had something on his mind. He had to talk about it. And, and this makes it pretty plain what it was he was talking about. He was talking about the gods that they were worshipping. Because these men said, uh, this man uh, seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities or foreign gods. He seems to be talking about a foreign god. How they would ever know that Paul was talking about a foreign god, I just don't understand. Because there were so many gods in Athens, they couldn't know what was foreign. Or who was foreign. You couldn't count them. But nevertheless, he was not the kind of God they were accustomed to. Uh, The Stoics and the Epicureans, or Epicureans, the Stoics, the ones who said there is no God. The Epicureans who said that uh, God is unconcerned about about the world. God has left the world. God has abdicated. Uh, God is, is not at least bothered what happens to the world that has been created. And they accused him of being a babbler. Now, the word that's used for babbler is the word spermologos. And the word spermologos described a little bird. Uh, We will see what this pecker of seeds has to say. Or sometimes, in a philosophical sense, it was used of somebody who came along and pecked somebody else's brains and picked little bits of ideas ideas of here and there and pervade them, turn them out as his own ideas. We'll see what this pecker of seeds has to say. This man, somewhere along the line, has picked up a little bit of knowledge. He's got a few ideas that he's rattling about in his mind, and he thinks he's thinking. There are people like that, you know, sometimes. They get an idea, and it rattles about in in, in an empty head, and they, they, they call that thinking. Some of our scholars do that today. And that's what they thought what Paul was doing. And so uh, they took him, quite politely it seems, to Mars Hill, because that was the place where 400 years before uh, Socrates, the great teacher from Athens, had stood. And by the way, they they said of Paul, he seems to be the setter forth of strange deities or strange gods. Do you know that almost 400 years before that, that was the very charge laid against Socrates, and the court at Athens had ordered Socrates to drink the hemlock, drink the poison? 400 years before, Socrates got the same charge laid against him and was commanded to poison himself. Now, Paul is accused of setting forth strange deities, strange gods. 
and they take him, this time politely, uh, to the, the open forum, and there they listen to what he has to say. Now, I know that sometimes it's been said the Apostle Paul made a mistake in his approach here. I've heard preachers say this. I've read commentaries that have said it. Uh, that Paul made a mistake. That this was the one failure in the course of Paul's ministry. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't see it. I just do not know how Paul could have approached the matter in any other way. There was no point in dealing with Jewish history with them, as there would have been to the Jews in the synagogue. No point in going to the prophecies of the Old Testament and proving that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. The Apostle Paul was tremendously adaptable. And he dealt with men where he found them. Just as a short time before, he had dealt with the people of Lycaonia and said, uh, God gave you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling your hearts with joy and gladness. So with these men who didn't know the true God. Wasn't any point in talking about Jesus Christ as the Son of God. They might very well have turned, down his, uh, turned around and said, Which God? Whose son is he? Of all the gods, uh, whose son is this Jesus of yours? So Paul had to identify God. And he found the people there in atheism, in unbelief, in ignorance, and he started right there. Do you know we've got a lesson to learn there? Sometimes we think we've got to sail right in and preach faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. Now, I'm second to nobody in emphasizing the importance of faith and the importance of repentance, the importance of the confession of faith in Jesus Christ, and of baptism into Christ for the remission of sins and consequently for salvation. But sometimes, brethren, if you preach that, you preach the wrong thing because people are not ready for it. They've not been brought along to that stage yet. You've got to deal with them where you find them. And Paul recognizes these people need to know the truth concerning God. It's important to know the truth concerning God, because after all, true life begins there. True life begins in the knowledge of God. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 3, This is life eternal to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And again, true education begins there. Oh, no, Athens is a wonderful city. It's a city of knowledge and education. The universities are in Athens. But they're ignorant men, because they don't know God. And if a, a man may be educated today, he may have a string of degrees after his name. He may be recognized and respected in the highest places in the land. But if that man is an atheist, if he does not know God, that man is ignorant. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where it all starts. If you don't believe in God, you have nothing to build on. All of your education, all that you know about anything else in the universe, has no foundation. Doesn't lead you anywhere. And you remember this too. Paul, Paul actually believed that the quality of a person's life depended on the view of God. The quality of a person's life depended on the view that he had of God. It's true today. It really is true today. The kind of life that is lived by people outside of this building is conditioned by what they believe about God. Now, there are some people who don't believe in God. And I've said before that people who do not believe in God may have everything in the world going for them. They may have fame, or influence, authority, power. They may have wealth. But there's a part of their life that's, that's missing. Uh, let me apply this. The psychiatrists and the psychologists today who don't believe in God who try to cure men, they're only trying to cure half a man. Because there's a part of man's nature that cannot, cannot be dealt with, it cannot be understood, except in the context of God's existence. That's why the psalmist says, my soul thirsteth for God, even the living God. And if people do not have that soul thirst for God, I don't care where they are or who they are, they're only half alive. However, before I get on that tack and, and, and leave myself off what I want to say, let me, let me pass on with uh, Paul's view of Athens. You know, it was after he'd been to Athens that he got to Ephesus. And it was from Ephesus that he wrote the letter to the Romans. And so later on, after visiting Athens, if you read Romans chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Paul, in, uh, let's say, a, 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 so, a more sober frame of mind... Paul, with the passion spent, Paul having settled down, tells you exactly what he thought about Athens. He says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the image of the incorruptible God in, into the image of four-footed things and creeping things. That's what they've done. You know, the truth is, 
that the Athenians were ignorant of God. In spite of all their education, the Athenians had, and let me use this word advisedly, they'd forgotten what God was like. And I say forgotten because, you know, God has never left himself without witness. The first religion in the world was monotheistic, not polytheistic. Not the worship of many gods, but the worship of one God. And in any nation on earth today where men worship many gods, it is because they have descended from the worship of the one true God. They have lost sight of the uniqueness of God. And they've introduced other gods simply to satisfy the inherent desire to worship. Oh yes, if men turn away from the one true God, they're going to worship something. They're going to put something in the place of the one true God. And the rejection of the knowledge of the one true God that is available to, uh, available to everybody leads men inevitably to idolatry. And they were ignorant people because of that. So Paul says, uh, I'm going to tell you about the one true God. I like the story of the little girl. Evidently she'd asked her mother a question about God and her mother being very busy had said, oh, I'll, I'll tell you later on. And the little girl came to her mother again and she said quite simply, uh, almost prophetically, Mother, tell me about God before you forget. You think about that, it bears thinking about. Tell me about God before you forget. Is it not true that many people have forgotten God today? God no longer has a place in their thinking and consequently in their lives and their living godless lives. Paul would say, writing to the Ephesians, without God and without hope in the world. Never mind the next world, without hope in this world. Now then, what does Paul say? Well, unfortunately, the authorized version has been a little bit unkind, both to Paul and also to the Athenians, in the way that that verse, verse 24, has been translated. He says, among other things, in the authorized version, I see that you, verse 22, I ought to say, I see that you are, well, ig the word is ignorant that she was there. Ignorant, a very superstitious. But he doesn't mean this. The word literally means, I see that you are in all things religious. Well, the Apostle Paul had enough common sense to begin with a compliment where a compliment could be paid. He didn't slap them in the face right away. He recognized that all of the gods that existed testified to the interest in religion that the people of Athens had. But he says to them, among your devotions I passed by an altar to an unknown god. Posanius actually says that not very far from Mars Hill there was an altar marked or inscribed to the unknown god. Not the only one in Athens, by the way. There were other altars to an unknown god, simply because by the time the Athenians had, uh, had finished devising in their minds how many gods there could be, and by the time they'd finished erecting altars to all the possible gods they could think of, it occurred to them that there might possibly be another god that they didn't know about. And since all of these gods were possessed of human passions, perhaps this god whom they didn't know about and whom they were therefore ignoring might be angry. And he might on top of all that be even more powerful than the gods that they did know. So in order not to offend the possible unknown god, they had better erect an altar just in case, just to be on the safe side. And, and these altars existed. Well, Paul says, the God whom you in ignorance worship, him declare I unto you. Now, very, very quickly. First of all, the fact. Paul says the first fact is that God can be known. He is near at hand. He is not far from every one of us. Now, that's something many people today haven't realized, even religious people. How many religious people are there, members of churches, who have sort of relegated God to the back of heaven? who don't appreciate the fact that God is near at hand, who look upon him as the almighty and the omnipotent, a stern, a hard, a cold being, somewhere in a vague, unplaced heaven. And God is not close to them. God isn't real to them. Paul says you can know him. He wants you to know him because he's near at hand. He's not far from every one of us. In him we live and move and have our... How much closer can you get than that? In him we live and move and have our very being. And then there follow three facts, as I've got them down in my notes anyway, three facts concerning the nature of this God whom they do not know but who can be known. First of all, he is the creator. He created all things. Paul says this in verse 24. 
He created all things. There's no atheistic evolution here in Paul's thinking. Uh, his God isn't a blind, mindless force or energy. This isn't a blow against the Stoics who denied, as I said, a personal God. But Paul says the God whom I'm talking about is the God who created all things. Furthermore, he is a spirit. He is an intelligent spirit being, not a thing, not an object, like an idol. For, for, he's also independent. He's uncreated. Not a, an idol's made, isn't it? An idol is the, is the work of men's hands. But the God whom I declare to you, says Paul, is one who is independent. He has, he's self-existent. He has life in himself. And he's uncreated. And then he goes on, and I'm rushing through these points right now because the time's gone quicker than I thought it would. Then there are one, two, three, four, five points here, very briefly, where Paul talks about this God, this personal God, in relation to the world that he's created. First of all, Paul says, he created man. Now that means to me that man's existence on earth is not an accident. It is not the fortuitous uh, collision of forces. It's not just uh, uh, force and matter interacting and consequently producing life. Not that at all. Man's existence is no accident. And by the way, I wish I had the time to enlarge on this. We often talk about unwanted children. Well, they may be unwanted by their parents, but I don't believe that any person is born by accident. I don't believe there's, a, I don't believe there's any soul walking ar around on the, on the earth today that is here by accident. And you can't believe it either if you believe in, in, in God. If you believe that God is in control. That's worth thinking about. Maybe worth discussing and arguing about, but think about it. God is in charge. God is in control. He's the author of all life. We don't, we, we're not the ones who are responsible for life in, in, in the ultimate sense. Life comes from God. Then again, not only did he create man, but he sustains man. He sustains everything. God did not just set things in motion and then opt out. There are some, some philosophers today who want you to believe that, well, uh, God made everything, but then he abandoned the world, left the world with its own devices, like a clock that God wound up and is left to run down. The Bible doesn't say this. The Bible says that he's both the creator and the sustainer of life. And then coming more closely, Paul says, this God whom I'm declaring to you is a merciful God. He's righteous. But he is merciful, and because he is merciful, all that ignorance in your life, when you made no place for God, when you lived as though God didn't exist, all that ignorance he's prepared to overlook. But there's another thing. He commands repentance. And that, that is a command. Repentance is not an optional extra. And I don't think we emphasize this enough in our preaching. Repentance is not something that's advisable. But repentance, which means a change of life, is a command of God. God commands all men everywhere to repent. It's a command for England, it's a command for Scotland, it's a command for Europe, it's a command for the world. It's a command for Corb, it's a command for you, it's a command for me. God commands all men everywhere to repent. And repentance means that you've got to change. There's no salvation without a change. If you're going away from God, you've got to turn and come to God. If you've forsaken God, you must return to God because God commands repentance. And then the ninth point here, because God is going to judge everybody. Paul says, the God whom I'm talking about, who made everything, who is not to be compared with your idols, who sustains everything, who made man, who is merciful and forgiving, who commands repentance, will one day judge every single one of us. And you know, I think when you get to that point, you're really getting down to the crunch. This is the one thing that you need to persuade men to accept and believe today, that there will be a judgment. Because I've said many times before, there are people living in the world in a way that they would not live in if they really believe that they're going to stand before God one day and answer for their lives. And the evidence of God's intention to judge all men is that he has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And Jesus is to be the judge on that day. The word is to be the standard. The throne is set. The judge is chosen. The standard is chosen. The standard is the word. The throne is God's throne. The judge is Jesus Christ. Because God has committed all judgment to the Son, says Jesus himself. And then, that's where this sermon ended abruptly.
It ended abruptly because he talked about the resurrection, and that was something they were not prepared to listen to. They said, oh, well, we'll go on, we're going to listen to you some other time on this subject. Did Paul fail? He didn't fail. Well, the very last two verses show that he had some success. There was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and that means the member of the court, he was a judge, a highly placed man, and there was another woman, Damaris, and she evidently also was associated with Mars Hill. She evidently was a woman of some social, if not noble, standing. And, says verse 34, others also. So this is how Paul brings this message to a close. This is how he confronted a godless society, a materialistic society. And I think, you know, this is one of those fundamental things that we need to be preaching today. The time has gone, it seems to me, when the Methodists and the Church of England and one or two other groups provided rich pickings for Church of Christ preachers. We made a lot of proselytes in those days. We made a lot of converts from the Methodist Church in, in days gone by, simply because we found people who believed in God, who accepted the authority of the Word of God, but who needed to be shown the Bible found of salvation. But society has changed. The religious world has gone on the decline. We are confronted today with a world which is largely materialistic, which has to be convinced all over again of the existence of God himself. We live in a world, in effect, very much like the world of which Paul speaks here. A world full of idols. Oh, I know that in places like London, uh, people don't worship uh, the kind of idols that Paul encountered in Athens. But nevertheless, there are so many idols that fill the hearts and the minds of men and women today. There are so many things that take the place of God that men worship. And that's what we have to contend with. Now, suppose you're present tonight and you're not yet a Christian. Where do you stand in the light of this message of Paul? The God who made you. The God who is merciful. The God who commands you to repent. The God who one day will judge you by Jesus Christ. You know, it's no use saying, oh, I believe in God, because like that, God is just a word. Belief in God is just an idea that you kick around in your mind. It's, it's not a philosophical concept. Belief in God, it's got to be reality. Because if you really believe in God, you've simply got to do something about the gospel. You've simply got to do something about Jesus Christ. And, and I was thinking just a moment ago of that glorious text that speaks of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, when you see Jesus, you see what God is really like. And when you see Jesus on that cross, you see what God is really like. And you understand what the love of God is really like. That's the kind of God that you can love. A God who loves you. And we want you, by means of the gospel of Christ, to recognize that God does exist. That he's concerned about you. Why, the baby was given the name Emmanuel, God with us. That's marvelous, isn't it? Let me spend one minute here, and then I'll promise you that I will close. Isn't it marvelous that when God came into human life, when God intervened in human life, he didn't come down as a great, righteous, almighty judge, but he came into the world as a baby in fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7. His name shall, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called, never mind the, the, the first three, the last one, the mighty God. A baby is born, but that baby is the mighty God. Isn't it marvelous that when he came, he came as a baby, helpless, innocent, and harmless? Who can resist a baby? Who can be angry with a baby? Who can look upon a baby as an enemy? How could God better impress men of his desire to have them for himself than by entering in human, into human life as a baby, as happened at Bethlehem? And that God is with us, and that God is for us, and that God can be in us. Because Jesus says in John chapter 17, John chapter 14 rather, verse 23, If a man keep my words, my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode in him. Isn't that marvelous? That God can come and live in your life. And that means the, the filling of your life. It means no empty spaces. It means no lack. It means no shortage. It means no deprivation. But it means satisfaction. It means fullness. And I say again, you are not living as God means you to live until God has his place in your life and until you and God are on speaking terms. Until you're intimate with God again. 
And that's what the gospel means. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that reconciliation can be yours tonight if you're not a child of God. Now, if you want to become a child of God, if you want to have God in your life, then come to him through Jesus. Believe in Jesus with all of your heart. Repent as God commands here. Turn from the past. And making confession of your faith in the Savior, be buried in baptism to rise to walk in newness of life. Or on the other hand, if you need to be restored to the fellowship of God, to be in God's family again, the way is clear for you. Come back and you'll find that God is waiting for you. He is not far from you right now. He might even be knocking at the door of somebody's heart listening to me tonight because he's calling and he wants to come in. That's the kind of God that Paul preached. Now let's sing up. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I do not know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me how marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul he looked me on my fault and saw my need. Time after time I went searching for peace in some void. I was trying to blame all my ills on this world I was in. Surface relationships used me till I was done in. And all the while someone was begging to free from sin he was there all the time he was there all the time waiting patiently in line he there all the time. Never again will I look for a fake rainbow's in. Now that I have the answer, my life is just starting to Sharing each new day with him is a cup of fresh light. Oh, what I missed, he's been waiting right there all the time. He was there. He 
was there.